Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you very much, Sebastiano, for this generous introduction. I am absolutely thrilled and honored to present this inaugural uh, lecture to the AAA uh, series for ARWA, the International Association for Archaeology of Western and Central Asia. Uh, you know, that's a new association uh, that was created uh, last year, uh, approximately a year ago, exactly. And I encourage you to affiliate with this, as, uh, with this association. Uh, the membership is free for anyone who is a, a national of Western and Central Asia. And you can see the website on the bottom of the screen. As you can imagine, it's a bittersweet moment for me as I celebrate the work of a dear friend and colleague who left us way too soon. I thank Mark and Mark uh, Lebeau and Barbara Helwing for their support, as well as the, all the members of the uh, liaison group, the heritage liaison group of Arwa, where Anis was until the Friday before his death, a very active member. So thank you all for, your, uh, for the invitation and for allowing me to give this uh, memorial lecture. I'm also indebted to uh, the Director General of Antiquity of Lebanon, Mr. Serkis al Khouri, who represents the DGA, and for the two regional directors of the two areas I'm gonna talk about now, uh, the North and Biblos, and there is Mrs. Samar Karam and Tanya Zavan. Uh, thank you uh, both for your enthusiastic backing. And of course, Sebastiano and Tara, thank you for your invaluable help in setting this first presentation. Even though it's only uh, me tonight speaking, I can confidently say that I speak for many people who knew Anis and who worked with Anis. He touched their personal and professional, professional lives in many different ways. And I thought of all of you when I was writing this paper today. And these are like um, a few pictures of Anis. Um, the last one on the on the left is from Tripoli, and you can see it's uh, it's a recent one because of the mask. And I thank uh, Jolt uh, Wagner, one of Anis's collaborator from Hungary, for sending it to me. Uh, the one on the right, you know it. It was taken by by me at the end of the excavations at Biblos in 2015. And the one on the top. It's a, it's a pain, painful one. And I thank Martin Francis, who was seen on this picture, who sent it to me. And you can see a very young Anis and a very young Jean-Paul Talman working at Ara. And of course, this is the map of uh, dotting the places where Anis worked. And I'm sure I'm missing some, uh, some dots. I am absolutely positive. So I try to remember all the places where he worked and I put them on the map and you can see the breadth of his, uh, of his um, um, hold on the, on the Lebanese cultural heritage. So this presentation will focus on Anis research at two Lebanese sites that formed parts of his master and, uh, master's and PhD. It is Tel Ar'a in the north and Biblos in uh, central Lebanon. He seamlessly maneuvered a transition from the Phoenician period with the study of the Iron Age II pottery from Ar'a to the defensive architecture of the medieval period, which sparked his interest when he was working already at Ar'a and when he became regional director of, uh, of the DGA at Tripoli. In 2015, Anis launched a new project centered on the medieval castle of Biblos. The aims of the new, this new endeavor was to conduct excavation in and around the castle, to reassess the existing plans, and to clarify the sequence of constructions of this defensive structure. Maurice Dunant, the excavator, the famous excavator of uh, Biblos, his plans, Maurice Dunant's plans, showed that a number of distinctive features had been omitted and that the plans were inaccurate in a number of places. These excavations that continued until An Anis' untimely death resumed archaeological investigation following the 42-year hiatus since work on the sites was halted in 1975 due to the beginning of the so-called civil war in Lebanon. And these are like members of um, uh, different um, uh, seasons of excavations and the supporting agencies, of course. Excavations of the first season centered on the keep 
or the donjon, and the foundation of the eastern walls of the castle. While subsequent seasons ad addressed sequences of construction on the northeastern and southeastern towers. I'll be talking today only about the first season, the results of the first season, and that's for two reasons. First, because I was part of the uh, first and second season, so I know, um, uh, I know, uh, what, uh, you know, um, the result of these um, of these uh, excavation. And second, because the result of the two first seasons were published, and uh, I can confidently uh, present them to you here. The others are yet um, are in the uh, Anis was preparing the publication, and I don't have the liberty of showing them to you here. Byblos is the only city in Lebanon that retains the majority of its medieval rampart, as you can see on this uh, aerial photo. The medieval castle is located to the southeast of the medieval city and overlies the fortification of the ancient city of Byblos, utilizing the foundations of the Bronze Age and Iron Age walls, as you can perfectly see on this photo with the two arrows uh, showing the uh, bronze, uh, bronze and Iron Age uh, fortification walls and the medieval castle is really was built on top of these uh, uh, immense defensive uh, uh, system. It was one of the first castles to be built by the crusaders in the Levant and specifically in the county of Tripoli. One of Anis first tasks on the site was to re-examine the counter scarp walls, the outer walls of the ditch. In Dunant's published plans, the one that you can see here on the screen, these walls were not represented correctly. They were resurveyed, and the position of the edges of the ditches were indeed corrected, as you can see uh, here. So Anise's new reading is in uh, black, while Maurice Dunant, you can see underla underlaying the new reading in uh, dark gray. Anise thought that the wide angles the, that he was able to retrace suggest that siege engines could have been positioned inside the ditch. The first of the three excavation areas was located in the courtyard of the castle to the east of the keep. Its purpose was to study the foundation of the structure. Two soundings, area A and area B marked on the, uh, on the photos were carried out to find the base of the medieval glacis marked by the red arrow on uh, the, right, uh, uh, the right slide. Here in this photo, uh, we can see the extension of these two soundings. We found a lapidary mark on one of the stones of the glacis, and you can see it on the bottom left. And indeed, Anis in his work uh, during the uh, five years that he worked on, uh, on Biblos, he was able uh, to collect um, uh, hundreds of mason marks and uh, record them. And uh, he started uh, the um, a process of uh, uh, gathering them for a publication. And hopefully this publication uh, will see the light in the new future, in the near future. Unfortunately, area A yielded modern power cable installed by the Ministry of Tourism and was therefore refilled. On the other hand, area B yielded ar archeological layers in steel. The base of the medieval glacis was found, and you can see it here on this uh, on on the slide. That's the base of the medieval glacis. This glacis is four meter long and a meter and a half high, and is built of cut limestone blocks. More importantly, the glacis rested directly on top of the rampart from the Middle Bronze Age II, known as the Hyksos rampart. The Hyksos rampart, built of large boulder, is currently located inside a covered building built with sandstone and it's marked with the uh, big red dot on the slide and it's located on the eastern part of the castle's eastern curtain wall. In reality, uh, and that's another uh, shot from, uh, uh, from the west of this rectangular building, and in reality, uh, the rampart of the Middle Bronze H2, the so-called Hexos rampart, was integrated into the structure of the medieval castle, as you can see here on the slide, uh, the uh, left, uh, the right slide. So this is the uh, glacis, the Middle Bronze Age glacis, and this is the rectangular building. So the uh, glacis, they used the glacis as a uh, as a support, as a foundation 
and built the rectangular, uh, this rectangular building, this defensive uh, building of, uh, of the castle. According to the construction technique of the northeastern part of the castle, it appears that the Franks initially used the Middle Bronze Age Glacier as a fortification wall for the eastern part of the northern front of the castle and added the, the limestone glacier as an additional defensive feature before remodeling the castle at a later stage and adding, uh, extending it and adding the part built of bust uh, sandstone, such as the rectangular building. So you can see here on this uh, section, uh, you can see the, the uh, later bronze, uh, the middle bronze age uh, glacier and then the, uh, the donjon, the keep built with limestone and the retaining, retaining uh, glacis for the donjon that, that is resting on the uh, Middle Bronze Age glacis. So that was the first part of the, uh, of the, um, uh, the Crusader castle. And this is the cut. In a later period, they're gonna, the, the, um, um, the Franks are gonna extend the uh, construction of the, uh, of the medieval castle and they will add a northern enclosure wall and a rectangular building built with um, uh, limestone and uh, what, sorry, built with sandstone and not limestone such like the earlier part of the medieval castle. And here is also a section drawn by Emmanuel, Emmanuel de Vaux, uh, uh, then from the uh, IFA, IFPO, from French Institute in, uh, in Beirut. And you can see clearly that's the medieval glacier the donjon and the uh, Middle Bronze Age uh, uh, glacier and the uh, later construction extension of the uh, medieval castle, all built with sandstones and not with limestone. We know, we know, uh, and and here in this plan, that's the uh, the earlier part, initial part of construction of the medieval castle, integrating the Middle Bronze Age wall. And that's the later uh, phase of the construction of the extension of the uh, medieval castle when they added all these construction here and all were built with sandstones. We know of the Middle Bronze Age II rampart running east of the counter scarp wall of the eastern moat of the castle. And you can see here the uh, Middle Bronze Age wall. And again, in this, uh, in this photo, you can see the extent, the line of the Middle Bronze Age uh, wall running towards the east. And uh, Anise did also initiated a ground penetrating radar investigation. It was done in 2017 to test the inner uh, courtyard to look also for other defensive uh, underlying defensive structure. And these results will be published in the future. It was done by the Pajmani Peter Catholic University from Hungary. And in this photo, you can see uh, uh, the GPR being uh, done on the inner courtyard. And this is, uh, and here we can see uh, Elia Ii, one of uh, as Anis' student uh, that worked with him uh, until his death on the study of the medieval castle of, uh, of Biblos. Another area, and that's area D, was opened in the eastern moat of the castle at the place marked by a red vertical line on the photo to investigate the foundations of the curtain wall. We can see clearly it, the, the difference in the construction technique of these two parts of the eastern curtain wall of the castle. One is made of white limestone and the other ma is made of the brownish uh, sandstone. And you can see clearly the, the difference in this photo. The first sounding uh, below the junction line between these two parts showed traces of repair and consolidation consolidation following the collapse of part of the lower section of the limestone wall close to its junction with the sandstone wall. Stones were laid in a staggered arrangement, what we call en quinconce in French. And these were consolidated with a mixture of rubble and stones and all embedded, uh, embedded in a mixture of mud brick uh, and lime. 
Of course, excavations were stopped in the sector as to not endanger, endanger the stability of the uh, building. And you can see here, so in, a, in, a, um, in an initial, initial uh, phase, uh, the, the, the wall was fragilized for whatever reason, and they tried to uh, uh, reconsolidate it using uh, a staggered arrangement of uh, limestone, and they added a mixture of clay and, uh, and lime to reinforce it. And that's why we stopped here, because we, uh, we would have been fragilizing the, the uh, structure, the integrity of the wall. So we stopped here, um, uh, the excavation. Anis then um, established another sounding further south at the base of the limestone wall marked by the red arrow on the left side. Excavation showed here that there was no foundation trench and that the foundation stones of the curtain wall were built directly over the Bronze Age layers in contrast with, with the sandstone where the foundation, uh, where there was a foundation trench. This indicates that the limestone wall from the first period of constructions of the, of the castle was built from the inside, from the inside of the castle against the uh, Bronze Age layers on top of the Bronze Age uh, defensive uh, system. And they were, it, it was built six meters below the level of the interior courtyard of the keep or the donjon. And I can uh, say that in here, embedded between the stones, we found a medieval glazed pottery. And the, the medieval pottery is being studied uh, presently by Valentina Vizzoli, uh, presently at the IFPO. Near the junction of the two parts of the eastern, wall, uh, eastern curtain wall, we saw an alignment of sloping stones uh, over here. And this alignment was already visible way before the excavations, as you can see here. They were, they were already visible. So we decided to implement a, um, a sounding to um, investigate this alignment of stone, stones. And what we uh, revealed, we revealed a sloping wall that the Franks had used as a foundation for part of the Eastern Curtain Wall. This sloping wall, or glacis, is built with large Ramley or conglomerate stones and roughly squared limestones, as you can see on this slide. We were able to follow this wall for eight courses, the uh, digging um, uh, for eight courses, but then we had to stop the excavation because obviously, as you can see on the, on the picture, we uh, were dismantling the filling of a later glacier that was built in front of this of this glacier. So we refilled everything and uh, and stopped uh, and stopped excavation here. The material that was found when digging in this area is composed of ceramics of local manufacturers uh, dated to the Chalcolithic and the Bronze Age period. And you can see here a selection uh, that will be published. Uh, so I hope this year in the Bulletin d'Archéologie. Uh, Et d'architecture libanaise, the Baal, uh, the official publication of the DGA. And again, we have a selection of early Bronze Age uh, uh, materials, such as these large vats um, combed in uh, interior and exterior. And we have uh, parallels to them from the Dunas excavation. And again, a large selection of combed ware. Uh, other inside and outside combing or outside horizontal vertical uh, pattern uh, combing. We have large selections and all have parallels at nearby sites such as Tel Fadaus, Tel Ar'a, Sidon, and all the way, uh, sites that yielded uh, bronze, early Bronze Age pottery. And again, we have also a collection of inside marks on jar shoulders, and they have perfect parallels at Tel Ar'a from the early Bronze Age three. The, um, again, what uh, Anis did after, after we finished the excavations uh, in, uh, at the foot of the Eastern uh, Curtain Wall. He also explored, um, explored the upper Eastern uh, part of the donjon where he, he uh, investigated the two platforms um, uh, that had each uh, their separate uh, staircase. 
ANISA's research and new plans uh, and new plan drawings of these platforms led him to suggest that these two platforms were intended to support machines such as giant crossbows. And we can see pictures of these two uh, platforms with each with their own staircases here and here. And, and they were already um, outlined in Dunant's excavation, but without any precisions. And Anis did uh, uh, redraw uh, the plans of these uh, two pl platforms. The structural characteristics of the walls indicate that these two platforms were built like the rest of the keep during the Frankish period. Anis also brought his expertise to a new area facing the eastern front of the castle marked by, marked by the uh, red and yellow uh, arrows. He excavated the area where Dunant had located part of a tower. And again, the plan of the, uh, of the uh, medieval castle. And you can see Dunant uh, did report a part of a tower here. And excavations in this, uh, in this area allowed Anis to uh, correctly outlined the remains of two towers that were part of the outer defensive system of the medieval castle. And he proposed their reconstructions. So here we, we see uh, remains of the tower to the east of the Eastern ditch. And here the uh, proposed reconstructions of the two destroyed uh, uh, tower by an east. And again, you can see them here in this area photo. So these are a few and just a brief overview of Anise's work and achievement uh, studying the medieval castle and the immediate surrounding of the medieval castle. And uh, there, there are a lot more work that has been done and hopefully that will be published in the near future and probably presented by those who will work on Anise's, uh, Anise's um, uh, uh, archives. If we move now from Biblos to uh, the air to up north to Tal Ar'a and uh, where Anis did his masters. And the reason that I presented Biblos first and then Ar'a second, even though Anis did his MA on Ar'a uh, is for the last slide that I'll show you uh, at the end of the, um, of the presentation. Of course, most of you uh, know Tal Ar'a. Tal Ar'a is located 20 kilometers north of Tripoli in the southern part of the large plain of the Akkar. It is one of the three largest, uh, large uh, sites in this plain together with uh, Tal Kazir, uh, ancient Sumur or Semira, and Tal Jamus. Excavation at this site began in 1972 by the French Institute of Archaeology in the Near East, the FAPO then, and were directed by its director, uh, director Ernest Phil. Jean-Paul Talman from the University of Paris I resumed directorship of the excavation from 1972 until his death in 2017. Ara is mentioned several times in ancient texts dated to the Bronze Age, where it is rendered as Irkata. The oldest mention of the site during the Iron Age is by Shalmanazar III in his accounts on the Battle of Karkar, in which Ara participated with 10 chariots and 10,000 uh, soldiers. This site is then mentioned by Tiglat Pilazar III in his campaign against Hama and its allies. Ara was part of the coalition against the Assyrian ruler and was said to be destroyed by the king in retaliation. The annals of Nimrud describe the sack and the destruction of Ara in 738 BCE. The city was placed then under Assyrian dominance and became part of the province of Simira. Excavation of the Bronze and Iron Ages were centered in area one on the southern edge of the Tel. Of course, other areas were open, but uh, those who know uh, Ar'a know that uh, four other areas, uh, three other areas deal with medieval uh, remains. And the fifth one, actually uh, excavation stopped uh, during, uh, during uh, Jean-Paul's tenure because he wanted to, um, uh, to focus on area one, but they reached over there in area five, the Hellenistic and the early, uh, early uh, evidence of the Iron Age. Remains from the uh, Iron Age in this area one was excavated 
and they stretch over um, 500 square meters. According to Jean-Paul Talman and Enemis, a series of six layers organized in three stratigraphic sublevels characterize the RNH2 at Ara. The RNH1b, that's from approximately 1150 to around 1000, is still unattested on the tell itself. However, a series of enigmatic stamped handles all found in open context in the three layers of the RNH2 are all made uh, belong to uh, jars, all made with a different fabric than the RNH2. And according to uh, uh, Talman and Anis, they should date uh, to the RNH1. And I say also according to Eric Gubel, and he can speak more about it uh, afterwards, if he wishes so. The Iron Age reoccupation of the site after a long hiatus did not occur until the 9th century BCE when a dense network of houses was uncovered. The earliest levels of the Iron Age II show indeed a series of houses of a built uh, and built of on a backfill on the previous backfill and separated by streets as you can see on this uh, uh, hand uh, drawn uh, plan. Many tanurs attest to domestic activities and no other specialized activities such as metallurgy, for example, were, uh, was identified on the site. According to the material, these levels should be dated to the end of the 9th century BCE or to the beginning of the 8th. It seems that the city uh, gained some importance during the first half of the 8th century, judging from a stone casemate rampart that was built around the tell, and you can see the outline and the remains of this casemat rampart. The rampart even cut into the earliest dwellings, as you can see here. Excavation in 1981 revealed a small sanctuary abutting the rampart and occupying a surface of approximately 200 square meters. And this is uh, the outline, the remains of this uh, sanctuary uh, abutting the rampart. The plan of the sanctuary is incomplete, but it was formed of two separate buildings, each composed of a series of rooms opening to a courtyard. The courtyards contained basins and offering benches made of mud bricks. One of the buildings had one small cellar, uh, very small, about nine square uh, meters, and the cellar was even fitted with an altar built with a, a stone. The size and the building framework indicate that this sanctuary is a neighbor, neighborhood sanctuary, most probably serving the cluster of houses nearby. It was impossible to restitute the circulation plan inside the sanctuary because of the leveling done in subsequent uh, uh, periods, such as the Iron Age III, but it is not far-fetched to assume that this shrine housed cults for different gods. Indeed, a large number of female figurines belonging to Ashtart and male figurines coiffed with the headdress resemb resembling the Lebede were found inside the structure. Actually, Eric Gubel, who will publish the corpus of Iron Age I figurines from Ara, he thinks that this shrine was devoted to the cult of a local pantheon and a traditional triad consisting of, and I quote, a pregnant, pregnant enthroned Ashtart, an old bearded Baal, uh, as indicated by a similar um, uh, figurines found in Talcazel, and finally a young Baal and the quotation. This triad is also attested in, at Talcazel and Tabat al-Hammam in uh, the, the Syrian part of uh, the Akar plain. I'm grateful for Eric for sharing with me uh, this information, and I hope Eric, I didn't put you on the spot here. In the second half of the 8th century BCE, Ara was destroyed presumably by Tiglat Pileser III. Indeed, a thick layer of destruction debris and ash covered the entire excavated area and over here. Everything was covered uh, with destruction debris. The ceramics retrieved from the destruction layer give a date towards the third quarter of the 8th century, corresponding perfectly with the date 738 given by Tiglath Pileser for the destruction of Ara. The entire um, uh, area was then abandoned and turned into a cemetery 
with crem cremation pits. And you can see the cremation pits identified uh, on uh, marked by the red arrows. Observation on the side indicate that charred bombs were not scooped up and put in an urn jar or crater, such like we see in Tyre, but were deposited at the bottom of the pit accompanied by pottery vases. And the upper part of the pit contained many amphorae, including some that were inscribed with Phoenician letters painted in red or black, such as these two ones here, two examples of these. We have, a, we have 29 inscriptures with three complete inscriptions, including two Lamelec uh, jars. And three of them were published by Pierre Baudray already. All the inscribed jar fragments found in the Iron Age II at Ar'a came from the, these levels, from the level of the abandonment of the sanctuary and in uh, the installation of the cremation pits. This necropolis went into disuse sometimes at the beginning of the seventh century BCE and was covered by a floor dated uh, to the sixth century containing antiquaire and Persian period pottery. Such as uh, we have also uh, uh, some uh, collection of uh, Cypriot uh, Iron Age wares, such as uh, uh, black on red uh, seen here on this slide. In his study of the Iron Age II uh, pottery material, Anis successfully anchored the local and imported ceramic production to the three levels dated to the Iron Age II. He noted that the local material was standardized and manufactured predominantly uh, locally. We have a small assemblage of Cypriot Iron Age and a handful of Assyrian palace ware. He also distinguished two main groups of fabric, the red-orange one, the hard one, used for shaping cooking pots, and a soft, buff, light orange one used for all other shapes, including jars. The repertoire of, of shapes is limited and consists of serving vases, plates, bowls, and jugs. One example is here, and you can see uh, the uh, si straight-sided balls. Uh, what, uh, they can be uh, wet smooth, or they can be also uh, red slipped inside or outside, or there's a variety of uh, the red slipping on these balls, uh, on these plates. And uh, on the right side, we have uh, the uh, hemispherical uh, balls, either uh, simply wet smooth, some of them are even burnished, or red slipped. And we have also a collection of, um, of um, uh, jugs. And this one, this is one of the best one. Um, it's very well known uh, in the uh, Phoenician uh, ceramic repertoire. And we found, we found also cooking pots. Uh, these are two examples. That's the first one, the second one. And then these are the uh, two uh, different uh, types of uh, uh, cooking pots attested in the Iron Age II. And uh, surprisingly, uh, most of them, um, approximately 75% of the, uh, of the um, I, uh, cooking pots came from the cremation pits, uh, probably attesting to the uh, repast, the funerary repast. And then we have uh, storage jars. The jars belong to two types, an ovoid shape, with a short rim and two loop handles known also from Tyre and coast of Syria. And on the right side of the slide, you can see the sack shaped one with a taller rim and monochrome or bichrome geometric uh, decoration. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ovoid one, uh, you can see examples of them it's still at Ar'a. If you visit Ar'a, you see them in the uh, in the, uh, in the room and I, I put here in uh, this slide where you can see Jean-Paul working uh, at his table and these two Iron Age are displayed over there. And I thank Guillaume Gernès for uh, allowing me to uh, present this, uh, this uh, photo. And you can see here a picture of the second type of Iron Age two jars painted with red and, uh, and black. So the collection, uh, um, uh, this was a brief over overview of the Iron Age II archaeological remains and ceramic material from Tel Ar'a. 
the collection of, um, uh, of, of pottery shown on this slide illustrates the main type that prevailed during the 9th and 8th century BCE as identif identified and studied by Anis. Publication of the Iron Age levels, including the Iron Age III, uh, were initiated by uh, Jean-Paul Calman before his death uh, in 2016 and um, meant to include the research done by Anis, of course. It is my hope as legacy holder of the R R archives that such publication see the light to honor the incredible work done by two fiercely talented archaeologists. And I raise again my glass to them. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, Hernan. <laughs> thank you very much for your, for your presentation. It was really uh, um, emotional. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so uh, I just would like to um, um, we have a trouble with the translator from the translation unit of Arwa. He cannot yeah. come, so I will ask you if you can to translate your presentation during five ten minutes. And um, I will invite everybody to open the chat. We will use it for the question to the speaker. Uh, all of the questions have to be written first in the general chat and following the presentation in Arabic from Hannah, um, we will, uh, she will answer to the question and we will transmit it uh, to her. Thank you. Okay, marhaba. Um, uh, Hanan Sharaf, I'm going to give you this presentation on the work of Anis in the area in Lebanon, on Tal Arqa, and the work of the area in the Biblos, in Jbail, on the Al-Ala Salibiyya. إذا منبلش بعرقة عرقة أنيس عمل رسالة الماستر بجامعة لبنانية عن الفخار من الفترة الفترة الحديدية الثانية يعني بين الألف وال 589 أو 550 قبل الميلاد أنيس اشتغل على الفخار على دراسة الفخار من ثلاث سويات أثرية تعود إلى تلك الفترة الزمنية وبيّن بدراسه لهالفخار انه هالثلاث سويات اول وحده منهم هاللي كانت موجوده موجوده عليها بهالسويه كان في بنا لاول مدينه فينيقيه بعرقه وتعود الى اواخر القرن التاسع واوائل القرن الثامن قبل المسيح بفتره السويه الثانيه عرقة رح تتوسع مع مع سلسلة منازل وكمان مع أول معبد إذا بدكم معبد صغير مؤلف من 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 اثنين شو اسمه مجموعة لا لحظات من بقلب هالمعبد في عنا السلة قدس الأقداس وبقلب هالسلة عنا الالتر الأوتيل لهلي للإله ما بنعرف لمين مضبوط بالتحديد كان المعبد مبنى بس على الأرجح ونسبة إلى الحفريات بتلكزل وبطبة الحمام ونسبة إلى إلى إريجوبال إنه هيدا المعبد هو مبنى لعبادة ثلاثة من الآلهة المهمين بالفترة الفينيقية عشتارت وبعل هالي لابس اللبادة وبعل الصغير بالسن أكيد كمان من هالفترة هيدي بنوا بنى أول سور فينيقي بعرقة وهو سور يمتد ويحاوط ال التل التل الاسري المدينه اللي كانت مبنيه على التل وبالفتره السويه الثالثه اللي بتعود تقريبا لاواخر القرن الثامن نوجد المعبد تدمر كليا والمدينه تدمرت كليا بسبب غزوات تغلط في لزر الثالث الملك الاشوري هاللي اجا ودمر بيقول بحولياته انه اجا ودمر عرقه وهجر اهلها الى بلاد ما بين النهرين 
وهيدي الحادثة صارت بال 738 قبل المسيح بالسوية الثالثة بعد تدمير المدينة المعبد والسور المدينة تحولت اختفى منها البناء والمدينة تحولت لمكان دفن ونوجد عدة عدة إذا بدكم مدافن معمولة هي كمحارة على الطريقة الفينيكية بس بها المحارق اللي نوجدت ما وقت حرقوا الجتة ما حطوها بقلب بقلب جرة مثل ما بنشوف بموقع البص بسور انما حطوهن على كعب كعب الجورة اللي حفروها وفوقهم الرماد وفوقهم الجرار الفخار واللي مهم بهيدول المحارق اجوار المحارق انه الجرار اللي انوجدت اغلبيتها مش اغلبيتها في عندنا 29 جرة عليها كتابة فينيقية عندنا ثلاث جرات عليهم كتابة كاملة وفي اثنين منهم لا عليهم كتابة الملاك والباقيين عندهم احرف فينيقية مرسومة بالاسود او بالاحمر لو انيس قدر من خلال دراسته للفخار انه يقدر يحدد انواع الفخار هل بينت بهالثلاث سويات بعرقة إذا بننتقل لجبيل، أنيس بلش يشتغل بجبيل بال 2015 لأنه كان مهتم بطريقة بناء القلعة الصليبية الموجودة على التلة. وكان بده يعرف أقسامها كلياتها وطريقة بنائها من أول من بنت. ورجع هو ل أكيد البلانيت المنشورة من موريس دينا وشاف إنه غير مكتملة وفي أوقات في أغلاط. فحب انه يرجع يرسمهم عن جديد ويرجع يقوم بدراسه بدراسه كامله وشامله لهالقلعه. اشتغل اول شيء بداخل القلعه بالدونجون البرج الرئيسي للقلعه وعمل حفريه هونيك بينت انه الحائط الدفاع الجلاسي اللي الفرنجه عمروه مشان يهدوا الدونجون البرج الرئيسي كان معمر دغري على الاسوار السور من فتره البرونز الوسيط الثاني وهو يسمى بالسور السور الهكسوس بكتابات الكتابات اللي بتقروها عن عن بيبلوس وهيدا السور قدر انيس يشوفه داخل داخل شو اسمه أودا مستطيلة معمرة لاحقا بحجر رملة وقدر يلحقه أكيد مبين برات القلعة كمان مشان يقدر أنيس شاف أنه في طريق طريقتين للبناء بالقلعة في عنا أول طريقة مبنية بحجر حجر رملة حجر جيرة حجر اللانستون الكالكار الأبيض وثاني مقطع مبني بالحجر الرملي السانستون بقى بده يعرف انه ليش في عنا طريقتين طريقتين لهال لهالبناء بقى عمل حفريه تحت سور الدفاع الشرقي للقلعه وهالسور هال هالحفريات اللي صارت بال 2015 بينت انه القلعه الصليبيه بأول فترة من بنائها بعد ما وصلوا الفرنج الفرنجة على 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 جبيل بنوا القلعة من حجر الجيرة الأبيض واستعملوا دفاعات القديمة من عصور البرونز والحديد هاللي إذا رحتوا لهونيك بعدكم بتشوفوا إنه القلعة مبنية دغري على سلسلة الجلاسي أو الحائط المائل الدفاعي من فترات البرونز من البرونز القديم للعصر الحديدي. دونك استعملوا واحد من هالأسوار ليبنوا عليه دغري القلعة الصليبية. وبفترة لاحقة عمروا كبروا القلعة وزادوا الأبراج الشمالية الشرقية ولكن عمروا هيدي المقطع من القلعه الصليبيه بالحجر الرملي اللونه بني دونك من من خلال هالحفريات قدر انيس يقدر بكل ثقه يقدر يرجع يرسم 
اول مقطع ل للطريق لاول بارتي من القلعه الصليبيه وكيف لاحقا بعدين زادوا عليها الابراج الشماليه الشرقيه وسلسله الدفاعات الشرقيه والشماليه وكمان بموقع بمواجه للسور الدفاعي الشرقي انيس كمان اشتغل هنيك على بقايا لبرجان اللي كانوا من اسوار الدفاع كمان المحيطه بحوالى القلعه الصليبيه وقدر يحدد شو اسمه مخططهم و يعني يقدم اذا بدكم كيف كانوا معمرين وكيف كانوا مبينين بالقديم دون كل هيدول الاشياء غير انه كمان جاب ناس من جامعة قزماني بيتر الكاثوليكية بهنغاريا جابهم تيعملوا كمان مسح جيو رادار بقلب القلعة تيشوفوا إذا كمان في بنا حجري مش 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 مبين تحت ال تحت ال الدونجون والباحة الداخلية دونك هيدول بخمس دقائق نبذه كثير سريعه عن المحاضره اللي قدمتها عن انا وعن شغل انيس بموقعين كثير مهمين بلبنان تل عرقه وبيبلوس ميرسي لكم